talking about the golden age of television. Mm. So as an actor who's based on this side of the Atlantic, yeah. we talk about the golden age of television. Is it a golden age? Are we in a golden age or a new golden age? Because I think this is the third or fourth golden age at this point. Yeah, I see that. That's what they're talking about. I mean, this particular golden age has gone on for a, a few years and, and long may it continue. I think, it, you know, I think people sort of regard the wire as, uh, as one of the things that kind of kicked it off, but... And Sopranos, maybe. Yeah, well, Sopranos, I think, came after that, but we've had, I mean, we've had Mad Men and Breaking Bad and, and, um, and, and Game of Thrones, I suppose. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, people say, you know, what is, what is the golden age of television? I, 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 I try to give an example. When people talk, ask me, specifically about the show I'm in, um, why it, uh, what, what makes it golden? Uh, and it, the show that I'm in is kind of difficult to, uh, to explain uh, uh, to people who don't know about it. <laughs> what do you say, by the way, when people say, well, tell, tell me about this show, I've never seen it. How do I, you describe I, it to them? I refuse to, to well, I, I initially say, well, it's dragons and shadow babies, and, uh, and I can see their eyes glazing over. <laughs> so after we get through that, what I normally do, I think you'll, uh, for people who know the show, I think you'll enjoy this. I, I've got a little video to show you which I have showed on numerous occasions uh, to people. And um, I'd say some of you are aware of the Red Wedding, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm seeing nods, I'm seeing nods. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing some nods. So anyway, I, I will whip out the phone. And what I'm about to show you is people who read the books, who have filmed their friends, watching the show on their phones. So uh, if you're a lovely video man. Uh, and who are you? Proud Lord said that I must bow so low. I think if you're talking about the golden age of television, from an actor's perspective, uh, that's what golden age of television means to me. It's about content. It's about, about gaining a, a, a visceral reaction. Mm -hmm. And that comes from writing. It comes from content. And I know there's an, a, a huge amount of people here are involved in, in apps and, and distribution and all that. So if you've nothing to put down the pipe, it doesn't matter what pipe work that you have. And again, I mean, I'm obviously very selfish about this stuff because drama is uh, near and dear to my soul. Mm. But um, and, and that's interesting, as you say it, because obviously if you've no content, so you need the writers, and you need writers who are going to write very good scripts. Mm. But clearly we always had the writers. We just didn't have the people with vision. We didn't have those who could who knew how to diversify with television, do you mm. think? Or we didn't have the platforms on which to produce those programs on? Well, I think, I th I, you know what, I, I think uh, the, the success of the Hollywood studios, when you're putting, when you're making a movie that costs 300 million to make, and it's another maybe 200 million to market this, the, um, the luxury of failure is not there. Mm. Uh, this has to work. And for it to work, I, I think a lot of these movies uh, can be described on a spreadsheet. They have to be. I mean, they're fantastic spectacles. I've done them myself. I really enjoy doing them. They're a different set of muscles, but it's a roller coaster ride. Mm. Uh, when you've got something that's going to uh, touch your soul, uh, question your morality, uh, and, and, and in, uh, for you to invest in characters that may not be there next week. Mm. And uh, again, for those of you who've seen the show, the, the example here is, that is the, 
the uh, very handsome Nikolai Costa Waldau, who played, plays Jamie in the show. I mean, for the entire first season, he was a, a beast. Everybody hated him. He was mm. the, the go-to bad guy. Yeah. And as, as this show rolled out, you find yourself having more sympathy for him when he, when he, when he discovers a spark of humanity in himself. And, and you can really only do that on television. You can't do it in an hour and a half or an hour and 40 minutes. And especially if he has a superhero costume on. Um, and because you can and develop these characters and develop yeah, you've got you've got yeah. depth you can take them in different yeah. ways and and uh, and that's and that's one of the one of the joys and as you say with the, you need the quality of the of the writing you need beautiful sets you need the you know there's a number of things you need it to be beautifully written uh, you know cast properly it's a, it's a very expensive uh, and difficult thing to to, to get right and it, and it can it, it takes very little for to bring the house of cards down if you like excuse the pun yeah it has been said that it is the third most expensive TV show currently being made. So, are, are you aware of that as an actor who has, you know, you've, you've acted in shorts, for example, you've been in Irish movies. Still do. Still do, still yeah. do. So you've been on sets where the money is very, very tight, and then yeah. you're in. What sort of difference does it make for you as an actor, though, when you have those kind of funds coming through? Uh, well, you, you know what, it, 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 for us, it, it becomes immersive. Because, uh, I'll explain, uh, the, the attention to detail on Game of Thrones is, is, is absolutely extraordinary. The, the sets, the props, uh, everything. They try and keep the green screen stuff down to a minimum. Obviously, we need it because you're, you're, you're creating a world that doesn't exist. So it's not somewhere, you know, we can go to Dubrovnik and, and film, you know, uh, some of that. But, you know, there's a, a hundred foot drop off uh, where it stops it's yeah. just sky and we we need to build another it's the same with the wall we have a hundred foot wall in a disused quarry a half an hour from belfast but we need to make a 700 foot wall to make the wall mm -hmm. so there's obviously but it's but it's 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 not necessarily for the purposes of spectacle it's 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 to it's to create this world it's a world that we can immerse ourselves in mm. i mean the other aspect with game of thrones is that you know I mean, people say that art should uh, hold a mirror of the society and when you're doing something like game of thrones you you it's it's much easier to uh to show what's happening in the world uh through fiction and, and fantasy in our case uh than it is to you know to be doing it contemporary because you you know it's li a little too close to home yeah uh, and it, well it's interesting at the moment because george R. R. martin's books he's still writing mm. You have now, the TV series has now gone ahead of his books. More or less, yeah. So in that case, has, has he stepped back, and stepped back and said, you know, do what you will with the storyline now? <laughs> or to, to, what, so. to what extent are they taking liberties with what he intended? I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's funny you should ask that. Because at the beginning of this, the reason George wrote these books, he was uh, an accomplished television writer. He'd, he'd, he'd done, you know, Beauty and the Beast and stuff like that. And... He, I, he got a little tired going to um, producers uh, when he had a scene with 50 horses in it and, uh, and the, the producers who hadn't got the money said, could we make it a donkey? So he, 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 he actually sat down with these books and straight in he said, I'm going to make these unfilmable. And that's what he started out because he wanted his, his imagination to just run free without, without him having to... Um, to check himself every time he was writing a scene. Uh, w will this get made? Mm. Why write it if, it's, yeah. if you know it's not going to get made? So he actually wrote these uh, in, the, in the complete knowledge that they were <laughs> never going to be made until the two boys um, uh, came along and said, we, like we want to make this. <laughs> he had actually been approached by some studios to make it before, to make a movie out of it. And, uh, and uh, he, 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 he just turned them down. He said, Did there's he? no way you can do this in a two hour movie. So it wasn't until the fine people at HBO and David and Dan, who sat together and, uh, and, and decided to make this, this particular beast. Mm. And, and thinking of HBO, because it's a, it's a cable channel, and for people to watch it, they have to pay to do so. So mm. a lot of people who are Game of Thrones fans that I know, uh, they don't pay, they download it illegally. Really? Yeah. Uh, does this, it's unheard of. What, what, what does this mean for you as an actor, though? Because this is a problem with these, these platforms as well, the Netflixes and all of them, if people are starting to download illegally. Well, I, th I think it's... I, I mean, our, our case is a little 
it may be a little different at the minute because the, because the show is so successful. Um, I think it's the most successful show HBO have ever had. Um, it, it is extraordinarily expensive because everything has to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, th I mean, it's the most, yeah, it is the most illegally downloaded show on the planet. It's the most simultaneous illegal downloads <laughs> on the planet. It's, got, it's, it's broken quite a few illegal records. Uh, I, th I mean, listen, it's, it's a, com a commercial venture. Warner Brothers own, you know, HBO, and, and uh, I'm sure they would like to be uh, gaining the amount of money. But uh, here, here's the interest. I mean, people ask, how do we feel about illegal downloading? It's a little bit different. I mean, you know, before we had decent broadband speeds, when I was on, on dial-up, before most of you were born, um, uh, to even nick a song took about three hours. Yeah. Uh, and when you've got, now with home studios and four tracks and whatever you want to do at home to get music out there, it's incredibly cheap. So you're, you're, you're stealing an eraser from the mm. stationary cabinet in, okay. your, in your office when you're doing that. But when you've got a thousand people and the expense of doing something like that, mm. Uh, eventually, what's, eventually what, what is going to happen, I mean, we are, very, as I say, very successful at the moment. Eventually, what will happen with that is it's not going to be worth our while making it because there's, there's, there's not, there's, the return will be gone. Mm. So you can do it, but you do have to keep in mind that future productions are going to suffer. At, 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 and, and this is true, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it stands to re it's a no brainer. Yeah. If people aren't, aren't getting paid for making the stuff, they ain't gonna make it. Yeah. That's just business. If if we talk about the golden age of TV, there were you know there was a time when TV was looked down on by Hollywood directors and studios mm -hmm. and actors. Are there still those? Do you think are there still actors and directors who won't touch television? Well, no, not anymore. I I do have a, a theory, and listen, as as the guy said, opinions and theories are like, <coughs> uh, you know, everyone's got one. Um, my, my theory about, uh, uh, about this is, is that it's so difficult to get movies made, uh, even if you can get an independent movie made, to actually get it distributed and get it out there. Because, because of the success of the studio system, I mean, they take up the multiplexes, they take up everything, and they're fair play to them. They're doing, fun, they're doing a fantastic job. Their shareholders are very happy, and so they should be. You know, the idea that when you make something that nobody's going to see, it's, it's very difficult, especially if you're, if you're an artist, if you're trying really difficult, and you're trying to make something of quality. So I think, and I think there was a few clever television executives said there's noticed that there's an enormous pool of talent that were sitting on their asses, not doing anything because they couldn't get anything made. Uh, and I think they were either approached by the talent or, or approached them and said, look, if we give you a limited budget, will stay out of the way. I mean, D David and Dan, uh, Benioff and Weiss who make this, they, they, I, did, I, I did specifically say to them one time, I said, what, what's the level of interference from the suits? Mm. And they said, you, you'd be amazed uh, how little. He said, well, we, get, we occasionally get notes from them. And because they're not, you know, there's no tsunami of notes, we, wh whatever they send to us, we take very, very seriously. But they're actually allowed to get on with it and make it which I think is why it's really edgy. It's, there's a spontaneity to it, there's a huge unpredictability to it, is that the creatives have been left alone. They've been, they've been given their budgets, uh, and they operate, as we all do, within whatever you're given. But you do get the results, uh, uh, like, like Breaking Bad, like Mad Men, like yeah. The Wire, or whatever, and, and we all benefit, because it doesn't feel like it's been made by committee. You know? at, at this point, you're filming series six. Yeah, yeah. In the and of it. there is a series seven. There is a s well, there better be. <laughs> well, and, and of course, this is for those who know Game of Thrones. Uh, there is a very high death count in it, and we never know from one season to the next. It's like who, life. Who, 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 it's like life, is yeah. it? Um, you never know when you're going to get it. <laughs> Do you? Uh, well, w is is Davos in series seven? Uh, I, I couldn't possibly, I'd have to, I would literally have to kill you. <laughs> and if I told you, they'd kill me. And is there a series eight? There's, you know what, there's, th there's th listen, if I was Mr. HBO, I'd want series 412. Yeah. Um, however, the amount, of, the amount of work that goes into this, it's, it's a nightmare to do, chronologically, because, because of the amount of CGI involved, the amount, and, and we have, 
it's not a normal sh shooting method on this. We have normally two units running permanently. That doesn't happen with normal drama. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for the last, I've been filming last week, most of it takes place an hour and a half up the road from here, by the way. Uh, uh, we've had three units running. Uh, so we've basically got three uh, television shows being shot at and exactly the same time. And they're filming different scenes then? Yeah, we shoot, I mean, we shoot in, uh, we've been in Spain for the last while, but we've also, we've done Iceland, Morocco, Malta, uh, Croatia, uh, but about 80% 80, 80 of it is shot, mm. is shot north of the border here. Have you ever considered moving stateside? I'm not good at that sort of stuff. Are you not? No. And mm. if another series came on board, another HBO series, say, heaven forbid, you were killed off in Game of Thrones, yeah. and there was a new series, and they said, but really, Liam, we're filming this in the US, and we need you here for... I'd get on a plane. I was actually asked at the audition. But you'd buy a return ticket. Uh, I'd have to see when I'm, when I'm going to be killed, <laughs> and I'd arrange my return date around that. Uh, they did ask me when I, when I met them, they said, look, you don't, you don't do series. And I went, no, I get bored easily. Uh, and they said, well, where do you want to do this? And I, and I said, the only thing an actor can go on is the script. And the scripts were bulletproof when I saw. They were just, just beautiful, beautifully written. Uh, and I said, look, the scripts are beautiful. It's HBO. Um, they make beautiful stuff, and it's up the road. I don't have to get. I don't have to get on a plane. I can literally. I can get in the car here and be in Westeros in an hour and a half. Mm. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. As as a, an experience as an actor, is it? And I'm thinking about. We were talking about Michael Fassbender backstage, mm. and the scene in Hunger, for which for a lot of us. Is, we would view as a very difficult scene to do, and I know both yeah, of was. you. Yeah, and both of you, but both of you met a good few weeks before shooting started and went through the scene and talked through um, your characters and that. You sort mm. of, almost like actors would for a theatre uh, performance. That's exactly what it was. We, we hold up, in fact, Steve McQueen, uh, who directed Hunger, he did uh, 12 Years a Slave and, and Shame, I'm sure some of you know. Uh, I had accepted the role uh, because of the script, but I had, for those of you who don't know the movie, I'm, I'm in one scene. <laughs> but, it, but, it's the, it's, but boy, it's, is it a scene, it's, yeah. It's 22 and a half minutes long. I think it's the longest uncut. It's 17 and a half minutes, I've been told, uh, before the first cut. Mm. However, Mr. McQueen didn't want to scare me off, so I agreed to do it. And it wasn't until I went to Belfast that he said, I'm going to do this in one take. <laughs> So him being a Turner Prize winner and a very avant-garde artist, I, I, I felt my, the reasonable reply to that statement was, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> Which is what I did. So yeah. I, this is what I love about Steve. When I went, went back and I had to reread the script to see if it would hold for that length of time. And when I read it, Enda Walsh uh, uh, wrote it. Uh, I, I did think, in having talked to Michael, that if we get it right, it would be it would be beautiful, but it was tricky to do. But but we got it, I think. <laughs> and and as a comparison of that experience versus you know Game of Thrones and what you're well, doing. Well, Game, Game of Thrones, Thrones the scenes are incredibly long. So oh, I really? mean, sometimes I mean, oh, really? there's a kind of a rule that it's a page a, a, a scene a scene a minute. And so a, a page is a scene. So if you have 100 scenes, you get a 100 pages, mm -hmm. whatever whatever it may be. I mean, sometimes some of the some of the um, uh, episodes uh, in, in, in Game of Thrones, have, when we get the script, they're like 18 scenes, 15 scenes, some of the, you know, the four or five page long. So I think, obviously, the hunger thing influenced the boys taking me on because uh, I can hold a long scene, or, you know, be part of the, that can hold a long scene. I'm not, I'm not used to doing, you know, MTV cutting. Uh, yeah. So we do, we, we hold long shots, we hold long scenes. And it's one of the reasons, it's incredibly difficult to write for. It's an ensemble cast, it's what, 25 or 30 regulars on it. And that's, that's you, you don't do yourself any favours uh, writing full, fully formed, you know, interesting, complicated characters uh, unless you know what you're doing. You're, you're, you're making things very difficult for yourself. But as an audience member and as an actor, it's incredibly rewarding to watch. For actors here, you know, going back to the idea of the golden age of television, actors in Ireland 
whenever I've met them and talked to them before, if they talk about theatre here or even trying to film here, and, and mm. particularly stage work here is very difficult. Mm. And for films from an Irish perspective, getting funding is very difficult. Mm. Television is obviously, you know, it's a limited It's difficult platform. for everyone. Yeah. D do you think there is a sense that you, for a lot of actors, you really do have to move to LA or move to New York to make no, it I in think television. All the lovely people that are here, the 40 odd thousand people have, have, have most definitely made the world smaller. It's much easier. I mean, you, you know, to do a meeting, you, you, you had to get on a plane, you had to, you know, tolerate jet lag and everything. You can do it on Skype mm. and, and, and eyeball somebody and have a chat and all that. It's, it's made things, uh, it's made things a, a lot easier to connect with, with people. A another thing which is done, I imagine. Are we dead here? Are we going over? I, th I think they keep an in every time I look at the clock, they start increasing the time. So the time is going upward for some reason. It should go down. <laughs> just to, just to let you know. But we've been caught in a space time continuum. We have, here, yeah. It, it just keeps, a, in, a it keeps it going up. So we're we're going to keep on talking, I think. By the way, if anyone has a question, by, by a oh, gentleman here. Did you read the Game of Thrones books? No. No. You purposefully I, didn't read them. I, well, well, I didn't do it on purpose. It was never going to happen. Uh, so when you first got the part, did they suggest to you to read them or not to read them? No, I, I did. I asked Dan. Uh, I, th I, 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 I have a bit of ADHD, I think, and I, I, I do. That would t it, to, to get the, I saw the size of the first book, and I, the, my first reaction was, I need to break a leg and be in hospital for six months <laughs> where, I've, uh, where I can throw myself into this. Now, now, to be honest with you, I, listen, my, the, an actor's Bible is a script. Yeah. Uh, uh, David and Dan's Bible are the books. Um, and I didn't want, cut because uh, the characters can be similar, slightly dissimilar, I didn't want the books getting into my head when I'm playing the scripts. So I, I specifically, George has pulled me up on this a couple of times. Oh. Uh, he has said to me, uh, read the book yet? <laughs> and I, and, I, and I've, I've gone, uh, is not, he not quite yet. He's actually told me that he's, he's He's finding it difficult to separate himself from the from the oh. from what he what he's seeing on television. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much of an influence it's having on mm. his writing, but it it, it is. Uh, I don't think to a to a detrimental effect, but but his characters now have faces, uh, so I think. Uh, you've no choice but to, to, to start hearing voices of the people you've been writing for. Mm. So I think there is a slight melding of whatever. I mean, it's not going to affect the journeys of the characters, but I, it may affect their, their character mm. as such. Spoilers, by the way, and that's, you know, you're talking about being able to do meetings and whatever over Skype, but yeah. it also means that people can tweet about spoilers very, very quickly. It, does that, is that something that bugs the cast and bugs the crew? You know, uh, it, it bugs us because the amount of surprises uh, uh, in this show, mm. uh, I mean, it was, a, it was almost a television game changer in, in series one when, uh, I'm sure that some people haven't seen it here, and I don't want to say, you'll know what I mean, but the end of season one when a lead character was, w they stopped episode nine with a sword one frame above his neck. And people, especially in the, st in the States, where, where they were used to the hero coming through and overcoming adversary and, uh, you know, the good guy. And uh, to, to watch your lead character, so, uh, and when you're watching TV going, what has just happened here? Yeah. When, you've t when you've taken this guy out. I think what you do as an audience, and I know it happened to me, when, when you're watching this, that your, 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 your head gets slightly skewed. Goes, hold on, nobody's safe here. Your emotional investment with these characters, which you hope are going to thrive and overcome and redeem themselves, whatever it may be, when that's when that's when that's removed from them, uh, when that safety net is removed, um, it makes it much more interesting. You are, it's more edge of the uh, edge of the seat stuff. Mm -hmm. and again, that's what uh, what makes it inc uh, dramatically interesting and and uh, and increases your emotional in investment in, into something as, as good as this. It's an immensely rewarding, but both to do and, and to watch. Um, they're giving us extra time, I think, so let's take another. Is there another question? I can keep going, no problem. Yeah, the, the gentleman here. You might have to shout. Do you watch it yourself? 
How do you feel watching yourself? No, I'm used to watching myself. At the moment. <laughs> I, 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 I tend to watch like that and go, oh, I'm not doing that again. Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of hypercritical. I did a terrible thing on my daughter. We, we, at home, we, we, watch it, uh, we all watch it on the sofa, the whole family. Because there's so many people in it uh, that you, 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 know, you shoot your own little bit and then they're off here, there and everything. So I sit down, I mean, I've obviously read the scripts, but I'm kind of a bit like the people who've read the books up to this point. It's that we know what's coming, but you don't know how they're going to do it and what it's going to look like. Last season, the Shireen thing that went on, when I, when I the, the stag, you know the stag that I carved? I liberated that from the set when I was leaving one day. Uh, and, I, uh, uh, and obviously it wasn't going to be shown for about six months, so I, I handed a stag over to uh, my daughter. She has a wall of awesome. You are her people, by the way. She's doing game design up in DIT here and stuff. She mm -hmm. loves all this. <laughs> so um, I gave her the stag and I said, listen, put that on your wall of awesome. You're going to need it when we watch it next, next year. So when we were watching the episode, I did it to her twice, actually. Uh, when I handed it over, I said, get, get, before, I said, go up and get the thing, you'll want it. So she watching. So she was in tears when I'm handing the. But the next episode, I said, "You need the uh, stag again." <laughs> so I made her watch the show with the stag in her hand when Shireen gets. Uh, <laughs> she was in bits. I felt like a horrible father. I felt like I'd abused her. It was terrible. So, she was, <laughs> <laughs> so she's giving it all that. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was kind of amusing. Yeah, one, it was good. one more question. Can't hear you. Say again. Will John Snow survive? <laughs> Let me tell you something. David Nutter, uh, who this magnificent director who did the last, uh, did the, the, the John Snow uh, episode, was at a party and a man called Barack Obama came up to him. Barack Obama, by the way, gets advanced DVD copies. He, he gets it before ah. I do, and I'm in it. <laughs> and and he, he came up to David Nutter. Uh, who directed it, and he said, Mr. Nutter, I have a question for you. And uh, David said to him, Mr. President, before you, answer the before you ask the question, Jon Snow is deader than dead. So I am not going to tell you anything different than the President of the United States knows. All right, the man is dead. <laughs> next question. Ne next question. Anybody? Gentlemen here. Uh, well, just the question was hunger. That uh, uh, how many seen, uh, takes? How many that it, takes? That it, takes. Yeah. it was a, it was a nightmare to shoot. We we did, with the one you saw is the fourth one. Um, they literally they, they literally had the camera in the corner, switched the camera on, and everybody just stood back and let myself and Michael get onto it. The interesting thing was we shot it in a disused uh, leisure centre right beside Belfast Central uh, railway station. We needed. 35 minutes of silence and because we were close to the train station the trains were coming in and out and ruining the sound or they were going to so the person who decided we were going to shoot the scene was the station master in in belfast central train station so we we, we stu stood there myself and michael like two gunslingers on the opposite side of the table waiting for a phone call because we had the timetable but we didn't know when the goods trains were going through he did so so we did the take when the station master rang up our first assistant director and went, and he, I remember him turning around, the first went, we 35 minutes, and we just looked at each other and we switched this thing on. But we got it, we, we got it on the fourth take. Yeah, the fourth take is the one you say. Ladies and gentlemen, Liam Cunningham. Thank you very much.